What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network. You're continuing our reading of the Bitcoin Death mailing list uh, that really does contain a treasure of knowledge. Uh, so today, today, we have uh, something really nice, and that is an email by R-H-A-V-E-R, -E uh, and that is a, a really good one, uh, because we're talking today about Basta Pay and the Bitcoin pro improvement proposal for this a practical sender and receiver coin join protocol. Uh, so of course, coin join means that several entities or individuals or pseudonymous of one individuals join their Satoshis, their UTXOs together in such a way that it's unclear exactly who can control which Satoshis. Uh, so thus we kind of obfuscate uh, the transaction history, uh, which is really, really nice. Uh, and here this Basta Bay uh, proposal, uh, is based on, uh, of course, Gregory Maxwell's uh, coin join protocol, but then also uh, on some other, let's say, uh, yeah, advances that we've made since then. Uh, so it's it's a really good one. It's a really simple one, uh, and it works like a charm. Hopefully, uh, so let's let's talk about it. Let's get right into it. Uh, this email is from August thirtieth, two thousand and eighteen, and of course, a bunch of work has preceded this email. Okay. I've just finished writing an implementation for this. I'm extremely happy with how it turned out. Uh, so back in August already, there was a implementation uh, and there are already um, several wallets looking how uh, they can integrate uh, this proposal into their everyday uh, transaction flow. Uh, so this is really something that will be applied to Bitcoin and a tool that you can use to reclaim your privacy. So I'd like to go and try go and try go down the path of a more formally describing uh, and getting some comments and ultimately encouraging its widespread use. Uh, so of course, right, we want to have peer review. We want to triple and quadruple check if this is actually secure and actually privacy enhancing and especially that it's not making things worse, right? Uh, so peer review is vitally important and that is what this email is about. Uh, a simple yet very efficient uh, first draft well, not first draft, but a early draft uh, of this BIP. Okay, into the abstract. The way Bitcoin transactions are overwhelmingly used is known to leak more information than desirable. Yeah, right, that's, that's just how it is, right? We, we don't have perfect privacy in Bitcoin. We just don't have it currently. Uh, and maybe we won't ever get there. Uh, if there ever exists something like perfect privacy. But there are a bunch of things that we know that we can improve and unlimited things that we don't know that we still can improve upon. Uh, so this is going to be a everlasting work and good that we're doing it right now. This has led to fungibility concerns in Bitcoin and arrays of unreasonably effective blockchain analysis. Yeah, Pierce, blockchain analysis is not a joke. Uh, every single of your transactions is stored on the indestructible blockchain. And there is further a bunch of metadata uh, that, can, that can be used in order to de-anonymize you and to spy upon you. That's ultimately what blockchain analysis is. And don't let yourself be fooled with know your customer and, oh, we're, we're doing anti-money laundering. No, they're spying on you. They want to know how much money you have and so that they can steal it. And that's ultimately what this is all about. So you got to protect yourself. No one is going to do it for you. Buster Pay, lovely name, uh, proposes a simple and practical way to bust these assumptions to immediate benefit of the sender and receiver. So what Buster Pay proposes here is that we break the main assumption that CoinJoin, or, or sorry, uh, that blockchain analysis companies use, and that is that um, all of the inputs of a transaction belong to the same entity, whatever, the, whoever that is, right? And so what Buster Pay does really simply, and of course that is what coin joins do in generally, right? It's that there are a bunch of different individuals coming together to add their individual UTXO into the input of the transaction. And as soon as there are several people in the input, and then as soon as we do some equal output mixing in the outputs, we achieve quite good privacy. And of course, that is what uh, the Wasabi wallet does with zero link coin joins. Uh, but here, the Buster Pay coin joins are a bit different. Continuing. 
Furthermore, it does so in such a way that helps receive receivers avoid UTXO upload, a constant problem for Bitcoin merchants. Yeah, so this is also really, really cool. Uh, Basta Pay is not just good for the privacy of both sender and receiver, but it helps the receiver of the funds to easily and rather cheaply consolidate UTXOs, right? Because with every new transaction, uh, most of the time, you generate, at so with one input, you generate two outputs, right? Uh, the UTXO that goes to the merchant and the change output. And after a while, you're going to have a bunch of UTXOs. And not only do they have to need, do they need to be stored in memory by all the Bitcoin full nodes, and thus it's a, a huge scaling issue, it also means uh, that, that when you want to consolidate them and make a large transaction, uh, this is going to be rather fee intensive, right? Because you uh, put a bunch of data on the blockchain. So consolidating UTXOs is always good. And Basta Pay helps with that as well. So it's both a privacy and a scalability solution. And that is always nice because if we have a financial incentive, uh, to achieve greater privacy and anonymity, uh, then it's much more likely that individuals are going to use this. Uh, and the copyright of this BIP is, of course, in the public domain, uh, as any open source information should be. No one owns this information, right? Uh, it's just, uh, well, yeah, we can share it with everyone. Motivation. Why do we actually want to do this? One of the most powerful heuristics employed by those whose goal is to undermine Bitcoin's fungibility has been to assume that all inputs of a transaction are signed by a single party. Yeah, that is the main heuristic uh, that blockchain analysis spying agencies use. And that is that all the inputs belong to the same entity. And that, of course, links not just the inputs on in this specific transaction, but also the history of these inputs to that one party, right? Really loosely speaking. So definitely this is a major heuristics and coin joins breaks these heuristics uh, and thus they are so powerful. Uh, and Basta Pay does it in a really nice way. In a few cases, this assumption does not hold. It is generally... Uh, it is generally readily recognized. For example, traditional coin joins has, have a very obvious structure uh, or multi-sig outputs are most frequently validated on chain. Uh, exactly, right? These traditional coin joins, uh, like for example, the zero link coin join employed by the Wasabi wallet, you see in the blockchain that they have a bunch of different inputs and that they generate a bunch of different outputs with equal amounts. It's pretty obvious that it is a coin join. And however, you can still, although you know that it is a coin join, you can't link really the, uh, the inputs to, to the outputs. So that is good. Uh, but with Basta Pay, we might be able to do even a bit better in some other aspects. So Basta Pay requires no changes to Bitcoin. And it creates Bitcoin transactions that are indistinguishable from normal ones. Okay, so these, this is awesome. First of all, no changes to Bitcoin. We don't have to fight a war to get a, set, a soft fork or something integrated and to get consensus for that. No. A plus, they are indistinguishable from regular transactions. And thus, they enjoy the anonymity set of regular transactions. And that is awesome. We instantly increase the anonymity set as soon as the privacy preserving transactions are the same or indistinguishable from the quote unquote normal transactions. Uh, so this is really powerful to have a coin join proposal that does not have any uh, or that does not look different. Uh, like for example, Wasabi coin joins look. It is worth noting that this specification has been intentionally kept as simple as possible to encourage adoption. Um, I think Bitcoin is a great example for this, that simplicity is very beautiful. And when we have a simple approach, we can then build on top and uh, add some complexity on top. But if we start out with a very complex and very convoluted topic, uh, then it's really difficult to make sure that this is actually uh, working properly and functioning correctly. 
So here having a, uh, a simple, as simple as possible approach is good, uh, especially because it's rather quote unquote easy to implement it. And thus we're going to have much higher adoption and as always anonymity likes company. So we need to increase the anonymity set. There are almost an endless amount of extensions possible, but the harder the implementation of the client and server, the less likely it will be ever done and will ever be done, right? And, and that's it. We can add unlimited amounts of complexity pretty much to anything that we do, but it's going to increase, of course, the difficulty of making sure that it works properly and securely. So having a simple approach is, in my opinion, very interesting. Should Bestapay enjoy widespread adoption, a version 2 specification will be created with desired extension. Again, we don't really have to put anything in stone here. We can improve and adapt as we move forward. And that is always very, very powerful. Uh, and of course, because in the current implementation, at least, no changes to the Bitcoin consensus, hopefully we can achieve the same in version 2. And then you individually can already today, uh, for example, do these uh, version two specifications. Uh, but of course, one step at a time. Okay, let's get into these specifications. A Busta Pay payment is made from a sender to a receiver, like any other Bitcoin transaction is. Uh, so let's assume that Alice is buying some coffee from Bob. Okay, that is going to be our uh, like spoken example. Uh, and that is, of course, could, could be anything else, right? It's just a sender and a receiver. Uh, however, it's important to notice that uh, it could theoretically be from the same person, right? Alice could send the money to herself and no one would know the better of it, at least on a blockchain level. Okay, step one. The sender creates a Bitcoin transaction paying the receiver. Regular, completely valid transaction from Alice to Bob and Alice's change output. Okay. This transaction must be fully valid. Uh, so this means, of course, Alice needs to have control of the funds in the inputs and they must be unspent transaction output, so no double spends. And uh, this needs to be completely valid. Signed, of course, right, with Alice's uh, private keys, she needs to sign the entire transaction. And all the inputs must be segregated witness. Again, that's why we see how important SegWit was to get into the protocol. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, SegWit was, is magic. Um, we need that because it fixes malleability. Uh, this means that when Alice is signing this transaction, uh, and it is only using segregated witness outputs, then they, she can no longer change the transaction ID of the transaction without invalidating the entire transaction. So with segregated witness, when she has signed it, we know the transaction ID, which will be put then, or which will stay the same even if it's included in the blockchain. The transaction is known as the template transaction. Okay, so this is not yet the final transaction. This is just the, the first round of communication. This transaction must not be propagated to the Bitcoin network. Okay, very important. Uh, so although it is a completely valid transaction uh, that is signed by Alice's private key and that could theoretically be published to the Bitcoin blockchain and assuming that sufficient fees are paid, it would get confirmed within the next couple blocks. And then, thus, of course, it will be irreversible. So it's very important that both Alice and Bob, the sender and receiver, don't publish this transaction yet. Uh, however, Bob... Oh, yeah, okay, next step. Two, the sender, Alice, gives the template transaction to the receiver, okay? And so Alice wants to buy some coffee. Uh, she signs the completely valid transaction, and then she sends it only to Bob, okay? Not yet to other full nodes, and not yet propagating it to the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network. This would generally be done on an HTTP post. Uh, more about that just in a second. The exact URL to submit, it could be specified with a BIP21 encoded address. Okay, so BIP21 here is a URL as we see it uh, right here. It would be Bitcoin and then here the, the semicolon and then together with the address right here. Uh, so, so that is, is really cool here that we can easily then, for example, have a hyperlink uh, to click on 
that would be something like this. But uh, the, or yeah, this is already in the in the protocol in in consensus here with BIP twenty one. However, we should add here now a question mark and then the Buster Pay, which then links to the HTTPS of the Buster Buster Bit dot com slash submit. So this would be the server of the receiver, um, as far as I know. Uh, and the HTTP body should be in a raw transaction hex encoded as text. Okay. Uh, so again, the cool thing with Bitcoin is we're transacting information here. And we can encode it in several different ways. Uh, and thus, we can easily send it as well. Right? This could be uh, sent in, in text form. Uh, so that, for example, you go to a website or, or you, you receive something per email and, and that just includes, for example, this large string of text works perfectly fine. However, we could also encode this into a QR code, right? So that you scan the QR code with your camera or your phone and then it encodes this information to, be, to mean exactly this. There are a bunch of different ways that we theoretically could uh, do this. Step three. The receiver, Bob, processes that transaction and returns a partially signed coin join. Okay, so Bob, the receiver, he verifies the transaction and checks if it is actually valid, right? If Alice has these inputs, if the signature is valid, uh, and if it could theoretically be published to the blockchain. The receiver validates the transaction if the validates the transaction if the valid if the transaction is valid and pays himself and is eligible for propagate for pro prop pro petition pro petition hmm, propagation i think um, so the cool thing here with this is that uh, bob theoretically could publish it but he does not yet do it because he himself wants to achieve privacy as well Right? So he is incentivized, especially because he can consolidate some transactions, to partake in this Buster Pay. Uh, so basically, Alice is announcing that she would like to do a Buster Pay coin join. Uh, however, she already commits with the valid transaction that if, if Bob does not want to do it, he can just publish the regular transaction and get the funds this way. Okay. The receiver then adds one of his own inputs, known as the contributed input, and he increases the output that pay himself by the contributed input amount. Really smart. So we have the one input, two output commitment transaction, so to say, the template transaction. And then all that Bob is doing is that he is going to provide one of his own inputs in the transaction and or sorry one of his own utxos in the input of the transaction right uh, however if he would not add the outputs then all this input would go to the miner right because the mining fee is always output minus input uh, and so bob should not stop here at adding his own input but he also needs to add for the the output that he is uh, that he is receiving from Alice, for example, the one hundred thousand satoshis uh, for the coffee that Alice is buying, uh, he would simply increase that amount uh, by whichever amount his UTXO has that he adds to the input. Okay, really important. So the mining fees would be exactly the same as Alice has proposed, uh, or it could be even more or less, right? Depending here. However, the interesting part is that Bob can add one of his own UTXOs in the inputs and he does not generate a new output, right? The output is still only one output for Bob and one change output for Alice. Uh, so Bob now consolidates and only receives back one input, which is really cool. Doing so will invalidate the template transaction's original input signature. Right? Because Bob has added something to the inputs, Alice's signature is no longer valid. Uh, so Alice, uh, or sorry, so Bob alone uh, could not bro broadcast this transaction. So the sender needs to return this partial transaction. Right? It does contain Bob's signature, but it no longer contains Alice's valid signature. And so Bob sends this back to the receiver, to Alice, so that she can add her signature. This is returned as a hex-encoded raw transaction 
a response to the original HTTP post request. Okay, really, really cool. Uh, so this requires several rounds of communication, right? Uh, because as soon as Bob adds his own input, the signature of Alice is no longer valid. However, the really cool thing is that with this HTTP uh, request here, um, so basically Alice uh, would, or sorry, um, the Bob would provide Alice with this here. Uh, then Alice clicks on or, or submits her signed template transaction to this HTTP and she returns pretty much instantly uh, the, uh, the input or, or sorry, the partially signed coin join, uh, the contributed input uh, where this is added, um, the partial transaction, and she can then sign it and pro uh, propagate it to the network. Step four, the receiver validates of course, right? She needs to check if everything is still in order. Uh, then re-signs because her previous signature is now no longer valid for the uh, partial transaction of the coin join, and then propagates it to the Bitcoin network. And now she doesn't even need to send it to Bob directly. Uh, she can actually just send it to a random uh, Bitcoin full node, uh, or of course her own full node, uh, and then well, Bitcoin is going to do its magic on the peer-to-peer -peer layer. And, and within a couple of seconds, the entire network will know of this now coin joint transaction, right? The template transaction was never received, but the coin joint transaction is now propagating throughout the Bitcoin network. The receiver is responsible in making sure that the partial transaction, that is the coin joint buster pay transaction, returned by the sender was changed correctly it should assume that the connection has been man in the middle, man in the middle M? I don't know what the last M is. Uh, and, oh, of course, the middle, <laughs> man in the middle attack, and act accordingly. Resign its original input and propagate this transaction over the Bitcoin network. Okay, right, because we have here um, several rounds of communication, we need to actually really make sure that we are signing the correct uh, things, right? Uh, so it could happen, right, that here during this HTTP request or, or communication uh, that someone else uh, has, sends a malicious transaction. And then if Alice, the sender, simply blindly signs this thing without really, uh, yeah, with, without without verifying that what she actually signs, then she could lose funds. But of course, you always need to verify what you're signing and if you actually want to sign it. Uh, so this is really nothing, nothing different. But of course, uh, we need to be really careful here. And the man in the middle is the major attack vector against this. The client must be aware that the server can reorder inputs and outputs, right? Also, uh, because, because the input is already invalid as soon as Bob adds uh, his input, uh, the, contrib uh, the contributed input to the template transaction. He could add this input uh, either as input number zero or input number one, right? Uh, so this is something that you really have to be careful with. Uh, and always, always, always verify what you're assigning, right? Because you cannot really take back a signature. Step five. The receiver observes the finalized transaction on the Bitcoin network. Okay, so now we are on the Bitcoin network. The finalized Basta Bay coin join transaction is now public, it cannot be taken back. The template transaction never reached the Bitcoin network. That was only between Alice and Bob. Once the receiver has seen the finalized transaction on the network, uh, and of course, on his own full node, right, verifies that it has enough confirmations with sufficient accumulated proof of work. It can process it as any normal payment for the sent amount, as opposed to the amount that it looks like on the network, right? So the network itself only sees the valid change address or change output, the amount of the change output uh, that, in, uh, that goes back to Alice, right? Uh, and however, it does not really know what, what went on here with how much exactly was paid. Because of course, the input uh, from Bob that was added means that it no longer, yeah, it no longer sums up quote unquote correctly. Uh, and 
Thus, we need to have now a, uh, yeah, let's say, an internal accounting system uh, that does not simply rely on the public network information because that will be obfuscated now. Uh, so Bob, the merchant, really needs to make sure that he knows what, how much he exactly received. And of course, he does that with, uh, with his extended public key and which addresses are actually his. If the receiver does not see the finalized transaction after a timeout, okay? Uh, so let's assume that Bob sends the partial coin join transaction back to Alice. However, Alice just leaves, right? And never signs it or publishes it to the Bitcoin blockchain. Then Bob will propagate the original template transaction to ensure that the payment happens and functions a strong anti-denial of service mechanism. So that is exactly why Alice in step one creates a fully valid and signed transaction that could be published to the Bitcoin blockchain at any time. And she does that because then Bob knows that if Alice stops communicating, he can simply propagate this valid transaction, which is not a coin join, right? Which is just Alice's single input. Uh, and thus, Bob can at any time know that he has the money. He just did not yet propagate it. And he has the optional chance of increasing his privacy and consolidating UTXOs. So this is really good. And it works as a denial of service mechanism or a anti-denial of service. Uh, because then if Alice just spams Bob with these, uh, yeah, with these input or with these proposals, then he just publishes the original thing. Right? The original signed valid transaction. Okay, back to the implementation notice. For anyone uh, wanting to implement Busta Pay payments, here are some notes for the receivers, right here. So for, for Bob itself, the merchant. A transaction can easily be checked if it's suitable for the mempool with test mempool accept in Bitcoin Core. Um, so this, this would as far as I know, check if it is a valid UTXO, if it is not yet double spent, and if the transaction format and all this uh, is, is in order as well, plus that the signature is valid. I think that is what uh, the test mempool accept uh, command does. I'm not entirely sure here. Tracking transactions by transaction idea is uh, precarious, okay? Uh, so this really is important because if we don't have SegWit, we don't have transaction malleability. So to keep your sanity, <laughs> make sure that all inputs are a segregated witness, right? Make sure you're running the most up-to-date version of this awesome software. SegWit is magic. It really is. And, but remember that SegWit does not prevent transaction ID malleability unless you validate the transaction. So really make sure that you're using test mempool accept at the very least. Uh, so I'm not exactly certain here where that the difference here is for the transaction ID malleability if you don't validate the transaction. I would assume, and that's like my noob speculation here, is that if you don't validate the transaction, uh, then Alice could simply change, uh, for example, add another input. Uh, and then the transaction ID would be completely different. So you actually really need to check if the transaction is in order, and then the transaction ID will be different if Alice changes the entire transaction and uh, also uh, changes then the signature, of course. Buster pay could be abused by a malicious party to query if you own a deposit address or not. So never accept a Busta Pay transaction that pays an already used deposit address. That is a really, really important point. Uh, because although there is no really a denial of service problem, because Alice sends the template transaction, right, which is fully valid, uh, and thus Bob can always be certain that he gets the money. Right? However, then what happens if here Bob uh, returns the partially signed coin, uh, coin join transaction and then adds his own input and proves that he owns it with a valid signature. If Alice then goes running and abandons the entire protocol, then she knows for a fact and she can verify it that this input, this contributed coin join input uh, is controlled by Bob. 
And that is really precarious uh, because that, of course, breaks privacy. Now, Alice knows which coins you have and how much. Uh, so thus, this means there is some level of trust involved. Uh, and th that's why it's uh, important to do this, not with, uh, not with complete strangers, I would say. Oh, and also, um, if you reuse addresses, right, then Alice will also know the signature uh, beforehand. Uh, and there might be some problems here, especially uh, with, with quantum computing and stuff until, uh, at least for elliptical curves. You will need to keep a mapping of which UTXOs people have showed you and which you revealed. So if you see them again, you can reveal the same one of your own, okay? Um, I'm, I mean, that makes sense, right? So if Alice abandons the protocol and she comes back, then you should not reveal a new of your UTXOs. You should reveal the same UTXO that you contributed to the coin join because otherwise you just give away some additional information that is not really useful or valid. However, um, because you have the valid template transaction, I'm not sure where exactly the problem is here because if Alice would abandon, then you simply publish the, the template transaction and you receive your money anyhow. So this might be more of a theoretical problem if you really publish the template transaction all the time uh, as soon as the timeout uh, is crossed over. Check if the transaction was already sorted according to BIP69. If so, ensure the results stay that way. Otherwise, probably just shuffle the inputs and outputs. Um, yeah, so BIP69 is a BIP that uh, defines how you could, uh, yeah, how, how you could uh, order the inputs and outputs, right? Because that's also something that Alice here needs to check. I think that was uh, exactly the receiver validates and resigns. Um, because that means that uh, Alice can here uh, can have a difference, right? We, she could propose her input as being the zero input, uh, and then Bob has the choice of either putting his inputs uh, as one, so it would be Alice zero, Bob one, or it could be the other way around, right? That Bob puts his input as zero and pushes Alice's down to one. Alice needs to re-sign the transaction anyhow. Uh, so you need to be here uh, clear with how you do the uh, how, how you do the ordering of inputs and outputs, and I would just honestly uh, either reshuffle it randomly um, or do it bip sixty nine, which I think is the largest input is one uh, is zero, and then it decreases with size, but I'm not sure. Okay, notes for sending uh, applications. The HTTP response must, must not be trusted, right? Uh, so that is Bob's uh, answer here. So Alice, uh, or, or, so that is Bob's, that is the communication from Bob with the partially signed coin join transaction. That must not be trusted because of the man in the middle attack. It should be fully validated that no unexpected changes have been made to this transaction, right? Um, I mean, that's nothing new. You need to validate everything that you sign. Don't blindly sign anything, especially when communication was done over the internet, right? Because there is always the chance of a man in the middle attack. Uh, so for example, uh, if you have this for, on, on your hardware wallet, uh, on your cold card, make sure that when you propose the, uh, the, uh, the transaction, uh, what was it called, the first one, uh, the, yeah, template transaction right here. When you propose that, of course, validate that what you're, that the transaction you're signing is in order. And then when you receive the partially signed uh, coin join transaction, also validate on the screen of the hardware wallet if it is actually in order. The sender should be aware of the original template transaction and it may be propagated at any time. And in fact, it can intentionally be done. Uh, so for the purpose of replace by fee, as it should have a slightly higher fee rate. Um, oh yeah, very good. Um, this means, right, that because, because we add some additional tr uh, data to the transaction, this means that uh, we, have, we have to pay a little more. And the question is, who will pay this? Uh, and so we, or I think Bob, yeah, Bob, he generates the coin join transaction. 
And he can either deduct the mining fee, the additional mining fee uh, from his input, or sorry, from his output or from Alice's change output. Uh, so I guess that's all, also the implementation question, right? Who pays for this extra data? Uh, it, it might be, hmm, well, I guess because the the merchant Bob is adding this additional data, he should be he should pay for it. However, of course, both get privacy, and Bob has the extra feature of consolidating his UTXOs, which means he has to pay less fees later. Uh, so it also could be that then Bob is incentivizing customers uh, to use this by taking uh, the the hit of the transaction fee. Uh, so I guess that really depends on, on uh, the specific circumstance here. Uh, and yeah, uh, both can publicize the template transaction. It doesn't have to be Bob after the timeout. Uh, Alice could also abandon the protocol and publish the template transaction because it's valid, right? And Bob will get paid. And after all, Bob won't really mind that other than the fact that he has revealed uh, his UTXO, which is not optimal, of course. So credits, this idea is obviously based on the ingenious mind of uh, Dr. G. Max <laughs> and his seminal coin join proposal, which we're still drawing from like, what, eight, five years later? <laughs> Insane. Uh, and reduces the scope inspired by a, a simplification of the pay to endpoint blog post uh, by Blockstream. Um, so yeah, pay to endpoint uh, is... is somewhat similar. Uh, it is the, the same basic concept that the receiver, the merchant, adds one of his inputs to obfuscate things. Uh, however, this Buster pay proposal is a bit more uh, simple and uh, straightforward. And so the pay to endpoint proposal uh, here, of course, can be implemented as well, but it might be nice to have a really simple BIP uh, for this and then build, uh, as he says here, in version two. Uh, to make sure that in the future it is going to be a bit more beautiful as well. Uh, so I hope this really helped you. Uh, I, I understood, I understand now this uh, Basta Pay proposal much more, and it really is quite, quite a really yeah beautiful proposal, right? You can easily quote unquote uh, get your privacy of having a mini coin join, uh, so it breaks the assumption that all the inputs belong to the sender to Alice because Bob puts his own input into this transaction. And further, it obfuscates the exact amount that Alice has actually sent to Bob, uh, because now Bob's output is going to be larger than before, and Alice's change output uh, no longer corresponds uh, to the sum of the inputs minus, of course, uh, the sum that is paid to Bob. Uh, so both achieve a lot of privacy, uh, both in the history of transactions, as well as in the amount actually transacted. Further, it's a great way for Bob to consolidate some inputs uh, because Bob already has this one uh, coin join input that he can add. And if he would not have done it after the transaction, he would have the one input uh, or the one UTXO that Alice has just given him and the other quote unquote old input uh, that he could have otherwise joined in this transaction uh, to then save on fees in the future. So this is a great proposal that helps both with privacy and scalability uh, and thus also with, uh, with cost. And I really like it. I think it's really something. Uh, so I hope you took some value out of this and I hope that you learned a little bit uh, out of this awesome archive of knowledge, which is the Bitcoin Dev mailing list. And in addition to what we've just uh, read here in the email, a theoretical proposal of the Basta Pay um, protocol. We have here a tweet from Lauren MT, uh, who has or who shows here how the Samurai wallet, an outstanding software wallet, mobile phone wallet, uh, implements the Stagano Stoneway trans Stonewall transactions. And Stonewall is exactly this Basta pay, pay to endpoint scheme. And he shows here with this example how powerful it really is in its simplicity. Uh, so here the first picture uh, shows three examples uh, of the exact same on-chain transaction. Uh, so this is the public information uh, that is known on the blockchain. And it's always uh, two inputs of 14 and 12 and a half and four outputs uh, of 12 and 12 and 2 and 0 0.5 Bitcoin. Uh, of course, we omit mining fees here because, well, just to make it easier. Uh, but as you can see, all these inputs sum out uh, to all these outputs. However, 
with just this information, without anything else, okay? Uh, of course, this is a very basic assumption, right? That blockchain analysis does not have any metadata, uh, but of course, the data on the blockchain it is what really is important. Uh, so what we have here then is there are different ways how we could interpret this. Uh, so one would be that Bob is sending 12 Bitcoin to Alice, uh, right? So one, in this case, Bob would commit both of his inputs and then send 12 Bitcoin to Alice. And he would split up the UTXOs in such a way that he has three UTXOs of 12, 2, and 0 0.5. And of course, we don't know exactly why he would do that. Maybe uh, because he wants to pay something of 0 0.5 Bitcoin uh, in the near future. And he knows that already and he's preparing his UTXOs, right? That is, would just be smart UTXO management. Uh, and of course, he could have done that. That is one alternative how Bob uh, would have spent the Satoshis. And this would be correct under the... Uh, all inputs belong to the same party assumption that many blockchain analysis companies use. However, we see here that there's a second alternative. Bob can send 12 Bitcoin to Alice with the collaboration of Carol, right? Uh, so we have now a third party coming in, and that would be then Bob providing 14 Bitcoin, uh, Alice, or sorry, Carol providing 12.5 Bitcoin. Uh, and this can be done, right? We don't know who exactly controls the private keys that correspond to these UTXOs. However, we then could also say that, okay, 12 Bitcoin uh, go back to Alice and uh, that would be her, the, the real amount that she sent. And then for example here, uh, 12 Bitcoin could be back to, for example, uh, Bob's change address. Might be. It might also be that the two here uh, is, or the 2.5 is the change address for Carol, uh, that she gets back 2.5 Bitcoin as a change. Might be as well, right? That would break already the assumption that only one individual has proposed here this uh, or has funded the entire input. And then we have here the classical, or well, the example of the Buster Pay proposal, which would be Bob sends 10 Bitcoin to Alice with her collaboration. And that is really cool. Uh, so the cool thing here is that Bob uh, doesn't even, it's, it's not even clear that he has sent 10 Bitcoin to Alice in this case. Why? Well, because for example, um, or actually, let's let's jump over here, which which has this. Uh, Alice would provide fourteen Bitcoin uh, to be here uh, as her. Uh, how do you call it? The uh, the additional input uh, that she provides, the coin join input. Bob would provide the twelve point five Bitcoin as a means of paying here, uh, and then Alice would get first uh, the twelve Bitcoin. Uh, and the second times the 12 Bitcoin, which would be kind of the change address um, of hers. And then Bob would get the 2.5 Bitcoin back here in two separate UTXOs uh, being split up. And so as we can see here now with the, with the different types of, of ways that we could theoretically uh, yeah, interpret this blockchain transaction, we really can no longer be certain at all as soon as we have several inputs uh, and several outputs, the assumption of chain analysis is no longer really valid. And especially when we have here uh, the Stonewall uh, or the Buster Pay or Pay to Endpoint uh, transactions actually implemented and used by several people. Uh, because, for example, if only this lower transaction was the case, right? Even here in the second example, uh, where Carol and Bob pay Alice together, we don't know the difference. And that is really powerful. And so this increases the anonymity set quite substantially. And I think this outstanding tweet here uh, by Lauren MT uh, shows the power uh, of the awesomeness <laughs> of uh, pay to endpoint or stowaway or uh, basta pay. And so all different names for the same proposal, but this is the basic concept. And I think it is uh, quite clear now. Uh, so this was a little addition after the fact of recording, uh, because I think the, the explanation here, or the example, uh, helps the explanation of this very complex topic. As appears, thank you very much, and see you on the next show. Bye-bye.